It may have been last night. I don't know. But anyway, I heard it this morning. We just we jumped on it right quick in here and uh, took a few minutes. And the next thing you know, the joy of the Lord broke out just like that. Hallelujah. Now, I want to pray before we get into this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to listen close to this. Just give everybody time to get settled and listen just a moment. It's always good to be with you here on the 11th hour. It's a, it's a very good time. It's a prophetic time. It's a time when we hear God speak so that we can make 11th hour decisions. Hallelujah. Now, suppose I told you of an ancient story of good and evil. Suppose I was able, suppose I was able to to reveal to you a very real ancient battle and a cold, hot war ever since that has affected all of our lives in the smallest way. Christians speak of the end times, but they talk of it in the abstract, that it will not happen in their day. Americans speak against racism and profiling and so forth, and yet profile and are racist against people like me over my coat. Most of the people who judge the prophet and the prophetic don't even go to church. They are backslidden in the faith and are under such conviction all they can do is lash out. Now, has it ever crossed your tormented mind that I just might be on the up and up? And like Jeremiah or Ezekiel in the modern time, will open myself up for ridicule with a message from heaven to save you and your children's lives. Let your mind drift down that path for a moment and think about it. I preach Jesus, him crucified and resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us and him and his blood and making him Lord and Savior is the only way to heaven. Is that so different from your forefathers and what they preached? Nay, says the Lord, it is not. So if I tell you of the last days that they preached to you and that they taught you of, you might do well to take heed. So while people hold on to their plush devils and petty arguments, the man of sin is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 inches ever closer to power. And not in your children's day, but in yours. Do I ignore the signs because of all your ridicule? Nay, says the Lord, you do not. Or while you throw me into a pit of quagmire with your words, do I not speak? Nay, says the Lord, you speak. And speak loud, because if not, the blood of the generation and possibly the next one will be on my hands. Yet if I warn you and you reject it, it's not on my hands any longer, but yours. This is why they scream in ridicule, because they do not want to be responsible for it. So did Noah's generation in his day. And continued marrying and giving in marriage until the flood came and took them all away. 
With that all said, listen carefully. Time has run up to the brink, and there is none left before a turning takes place. Time is the essence of the prophetic in the natural world. Now I'm going to tell you of something. This ancient fight began. It began so long ago. And men have lost sight of it. They have become so accustomed to this fight and so accustomed to accepting all of its outcroppings that they don't even resist much anymore. But yet the fight continues. And it goes on. See, there, was, there has to be a way that God brought from the spirit world into the natural realm. There is a way that he creates for everything you see, the world, the trees, the giraffes, the tomatoes, everything you see that the Hebrew God created came from nothing but his word, which is everything. It came from the world where he is into a world where you can live where you, can, you and I can exist and be animated and express ourselves. And it came from that world into our world. And material life became manifested material glory. The glory of the Lord. And so angels had never seen such a thing, but they were called upon for a, a certain thing when it began. The book of Job declares that they shouted for joy. The sons of God shouted for joy when the Lord laid the foundations of the earth. They shouted. Why would they shout? Because of frequencies and sounds. It would move itself around in the earth. This is what you see people in New age and things try to communicate with. They try to hear the hum of the universe and of the earth. It's the sound of the vibrations of the shout that arranged itself in order for God's word to, to have expression. And the scripture talks about how it was done. And in those days... There was an archangel that was anointed. And this archangel was a cherub. And he was a very special cherub to heaven. He was known by God personally and known by all the other angelic hosts. Very personal. His name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. It was Lucifer, the light bearer. It means he bore the light of God. What this is talking about, the scripture says in Ezekiel 28, that he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. These stones of fire represent revelations of God. Remember, God is laying the foundations of the earth. He's getting ready to create everything. He's making a habitation for his heirs to come. This was only known by him at the time. And so this angel was anointed, and it's the only angelic creature we have record of who was anointed. And it was this knowledge that Satan, who is known now as the devil, it is now this knowledge that he's used to deceive millions of people. There are churches of Satan. There's, there's followers in witchcraft in the occult. And they follow the Lord of filth, the belching of flies. They follow him all the time. And they believe 
because he used that anointing to deceive. And so he, he knew he was something special because he wore the ephod. Every precious stone was his covering. It means it was all the jewels like in the ephod of a high priest. And that's what his role was in the days before Adam was ever created. He was the high priest of that time. And his job was to walk up and down in the stones of fire and take that anointing. He was a living instrument. The scripture says that in him was prepared timbrels or tambourines inside him. That he had these pipes that came from his body. They were bezels that you fasten those jewels from the, from the ephod in them. And those, those bezels or bezels were hollow pipes that echoed sound. And in Isaiah 14, it talks about in, in the Hebrew translated words, it talks about how he had, he had vials. He had, he, he, he was an instrument of praise. And his job was to walk up and down in the stones of fire. And he would see a bright revelation in those stones. This is why you see people in metaphysical cults. They take off their shoes and walk barefoot over the stones. But instead of recognizing by Christians that they are this is demonic what they're doing. Christians just sit back and ooh and awe at the fact their feet doesn't get burned. They're, they're mimicking Lucifer's walk in the stones of fire, looking for the knowledge of the unseen world. And they look down, and, and this is what Lucifer did. He looked down and saw this bright revelation. He would take the revelation into his self, and he would lift himself up according to Ezekiel 28, and he would lift himself up high. And in those days, there was a crystalline canopy that went all the way around the earth. And if a sound hit it, it was thin metallic plates that filtered out certain ultraviolet rays and only let certain into the earth and the earth was a paradise. It was perfect. And those metal canopies served as a sound resounding piece of metal and it would hit that metal and it would reverberate around the earth and it was the ultimate surround sound. And when Lucifer would find a revelation, he would lift himself up to the center of the earth because of his beauty. And he would begin to let those tambourines beat and those pipes sound and the ephod would light up. And he would open his mouth as an instrument and sing this revelation. And all the earth, all the creatures, the, the animal kingdom, it's because that was the highest of the kingdoms in those times under the angelic kingdom in the earth and he would sing it and they would hear it in their ears and the scripture said that his throne set on the earth above uh, below the clouds and it was on the mount of jericho which translates the moon and the scripture talks about uh, how he would lift himself above the heights of the clouds this is what he said showing he was on the earth he was here to establish it for something God was going to do. And he would sing and it would hit the crystalline canopy and it would go around the earth and the vibrations and the sounds and the angels would shout for joy and they would shout and the frequencies would move and shake and move and it was a move of love and a, of God's word and it would begin to shift things in the earth. And what was happening was the creative power from the unseen of God's world was coming into the scene of the natural realm. In Jeremiah chapter 4, it says that there were cities, there were fruitful places, there was birds, and, uh, but there was no man. So this was a time before man. And this thing would move 
And it would move itself in such a vibrated way that it would actually form cities and the creation would do what it was supposed to do for God's command. Then the day came when Lucifer was walking up and down in the stones of fire. And he saw this brightest revelation he had ever seen. And with excitement, he picked it up. And when he did, he took it within himself. And the song revealed the air of God that was coming. And it dawned on the light bearer that he didn't need all of this creation. He didn't need the fruitful place. He didn't need the cities. He didn't need the light. He didn't need the animals. He didn't, needed nothing. He was an angelic being. That suddenly he knew it was made for someone else. And in the revelation, he saw the man that was coming. And he looked at that revelation and it filled him with violence. And it filled him with wrath, Ezekiel 28 talks about. And so he took his court case to heaven and to the court of Jehovah in the court of Yahweh. Listen to me close. As a prophet begins to tell you what a satanic, a satanic church or a Satanist will not tell you. Because they know it's their defeat. They know. And they know of the war. But they use you as pawns and plug you into their satanic worship. And you see the church of Satan in California. You see the satanic Bible that was written. You see. And you see the outcroppings of it show up everywhere. You see as the WEF brought a witch onto their stage to bless their endeavors. You see as their false, dark-eyed prophet, Noah Harari, speaks up against the God of the Hebrew Bible. He knows of the war, but he counts on you knowing not of it. So when Lucifer found this anointing, this, through this anointing, he found this revelation. He knew that this revelation was the man that was coming, and, but he didn't know what a man was. He just knew he was right under God. He knew he was God's heir, so he knew the earth was going to be as his inheritance. And the scripture says that he gave the earth to the children of men. This filled Lucifer with violence. He decided to go on a legal precedent to the court of Yahweh. And he goes up before the court. And Hebrews 2 records Psalm 8. And David being a prophet in Psalm 8 recorded the event of what happened. As he heard the conversation in the court of heaven. The court scene opened. And Lucifer said, O oh Jehovah, our Adonai, our Adon, our Master, how excellent is your authority, your name, and all the earth who has set your glory above the heavens. And then he begins to spout something that he could have only found in the revelation of the stones. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you would visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels. And this word angels in Hebrew is Elohim. It's the word for gods. You made him a little lower than you. And you crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have the dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, as he closed his case, 
how excellent is thy authority in all the earth. It was over the earth and who was going to inherit it. And he said, you've made this man that even their babies and their sucklings, speaking of nursing the breasts, said there's something in their mouths that will stop the enemy in his tracks and stop any bad harvest from coming. You gave him to have dominion over everything you've made. You've above the moon and the stars. And he said he made that with his hands. And he said you gave him dominion over everything you have made with your fingers or your hands. And he made all of that with his fingers. So what is this man? What is this man or his children that you personally, oh great God, would go visit him as you would visit your children on Christmas morning, as you would come and see them, and it be the brightness of your day when they come by your home to sit down with you. And you'll offer them food. You'll make them meals. You'll do anything to keep your children there with you for a while. Because as you look at their faces, even if they're 19, 20, 25, 35, it makes no difference how old in your mind their little faces are your children. And you want to spend all the time you can with them. And so you'll, you'll just offer anything. Sit down. Let's talk about this. Let's watch this. Let me, let me fix you a dinner. Let me do this. Because you enjoy their presence so. This is what threw this angelic creature into a tailspin. What is this man that you would go visit his children? You would visit him. Or his children. What is he? That you would sit down with him. We see that with Abraham as he came and sat down with Abraham. Abraham said, stay while I fix you uh, something to eat and wash your feet. He said, go on and do what you said. I'll stay. He wanted to stay. And the only time he got up to leave in Genesis 18 and 19 was when Sarai or Sarah started lying. When she said, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, yeah, but you did. And he got up to leave. He can't stay in the presence of lying because Satan is the father of all liars and any lie comes from him to try to stop a promise and he had come by to give him the give him the promise so when Lucifer went up he had a song in his heart he knew he was going to have to lift himself up to the center of the earth and sing the song of the heir of God coming to the earth. When he did this, he left there in a dilemma. And the dilemma filled him with rage. His throne had been on the earth and he wanted the earth. He wanted it. He wanted it terribly. He thought it was his. So the day came to sing the song. The day came to go up and sing the song and let it reverberate around the creation. And so he, he walked to the, to the center of the earth maybe. From his throne in Jericho, he stood up and he lifted himself up to the center because he's a cherub and he spread his wings and the timbrel started to beat and the pipe started to sound. And the establishment of the high priest, the ephod, began to shine and glow. And so he began to prepare himself. And the earth got ready to hear his voice, to hear the sweet song of the Lord. And the angelic creatures were ready to shout. All the vibrations were ready to happen. And Isaiah and Isaiah 14 asked the question, Prophets are always asking, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Revealing to you and me that Jesus, whose personal angel he was, that Jesus is the bright and morning star, and this is the son of the morning, the servant 
of Jesus, the Word. That's why he could carry the Word. He served the Word. And that day he mishandled it. That day he blasphemed. That day he took the Word of God and twisted it into a lie. He was a murderer from the beginning. And you're about to learn how. So he began to sound his instrument. Listen close. Oh, ye Satanists that are tuned in. Listen close. For the day will come when you will lay on your bed gasping for breath. And those demons you served will come for you. And they'll claim their own. And you will spend an eternity in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, not even prepared for you, but yet prepared for the devil and his angels. Angels are servants and messengers, and you have become such. So listen close, at least after today, your blood won't be on my hands. It will be on your decision. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? How art thou fallen from Lucifer, from he heaven, O Lucifer, you son of the morning, you servant of the word, you who bore the word and carried it to the earth. How did you get cut down to the ground, never to ascend there again? How? You that didst weaken the nations. Now he's speaking of the end times, the nations. The prophet is spanning time from what happened to what will happen. I hope you hear this. I hope Christians hear what I'm saying. For thou hast said in thine heart, he said, this is how you fell. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, showing he was on the earth. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. What does that mean? Don't pretend to know if you don't know. Sitting on the sides of the north in the congregation, in the sides of the north, the scripture says God's throne, it teaches us that help doesn't come from the south, the east, and the west, but it comes from God. In the north is where his throne sits. And he's speaking of this. Lucifer knows of a place that you know not of. And Christians don't teach of it. But yet Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, all of you in the, in the denominational world, you teach that Lucifer was a praise angel, but yet you fail to produce scripture to show where or how. You just say he was. This is, this is the scriptures where it comes from. You've closed your mind to revelation which makes you open to deception. You must listen, for time is closing, and a new time will start. He said, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. This is the song of the man. And he showed the man's authority. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, showing you he's in the earth, below the clouds. I will be, and here is the key, like, like the Most High. He was singing the song of the image and the likeness of God. The revelation of the man who would inherit the cities of Jeremiah 4. Who would have the fruitful places of Jeremiah 4. He was to sing it about the, the heir of God that was coming. Adam. And 
he refused to do it. He said, I want the position. Five I wills, he said. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. But yet, verse 15 said, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And this is his future. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man now? Listen how it's speaking. So he's telling you that this song was to make him a man. He wanted the man's position. Now he's speaking of the Antichrist that every Baptist teaches. Every denominational church has an understanding of the man of sin that will come. But they have him in the sense of the abstract, that he'll come not in their time. Because usually when they say it, they say, if he don't come in my time, he'll come in my children's time. And they excuse themselves from the responsibility of the war, of resisting the Antichrist. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Now you see he went from the beginning all the way to the Antichrist. A prophet can span time in their spirit. And they see a rolling idea and a showing what happened from the end, from the beginning, and from ancient times of things that haven't happened yet. Isaiah 46.10 so before you write off this prophet in what I'm saying, you might want to consider this and not look at it so narrowly. For now it is beginning. And the four angelic spirits that are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6. Now we span to the New Testament. What are we looking for? Now the time in the present, and then we'll see the time that's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm Baptist. I don't listen to you. Well, be real quiet and turn the volume down, and only you will know you heard. But you might not want to be so quick to write off. You who say... I would have never written off the prophecies of Jeremiah. And yet, a modern prophet sits behind the word, proclaims the blood, and you will not hear them. Consider this. You would have never let Jesus preach in your church because of his hair and the forked beard he wore that hung about six inches below his chin and the, maybe the ringlet he had. Maybe you would have, and the, and the robe and the sandals. You would have never let him preach in your modern church. Consider this, how John the Baptist would have been all but stoned in the modern church. Ephesians 6 is now where the battle has come. Finally, my brethren, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on God's war clothes. Put on his war clothes so that hell will see that they are fighting God in every born-again believer. That you may be able to stand against the cunnings, the wiles of the devil. The devil, the devil. He has wiles, he has cunnings. The diabolical one. The devil. He has cunnings. He has 
these things. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against this. The wiles of the devil. The word devil, the personal supreme spirit of, of evil, often represented in Christian belief as the tempter of humankind, the leader of all apostate angels, and the ruler of hell, the devil. Here, the word devil is diablos, a traducer, especially Satan, false accuser, devil, slanderer. This is the devil. And he said he's come. And he has wiles. And he has temptings. And he has plans. And they're way bigger than your little world that you live in. Noah Harari said when asked, what are you going to do with all these other people? He said, we will keep them occupied with video games and cell phones while they change the world. Out of his mouth was also said, and they call him their prophet of the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Think about it. They, he said himself, why do we need so many humans as if he's not one? So what is speaking through him if he says we don't need so many humans? He never denied there was a God. And he never denied it was the God of the Hebrew Bible that's the one true God. He just said all he managed to create was trees, tomatoes, giraffes, and humans. He said, we're going beyond him, and we're going to create inorganic life. They're going to create non-carbon-based life. What could he possibly be speaking of? Until he got to the point where the, uh, the interviewer asked him, will we even be human anymore? Because he spoke of putting chips in people. He spoke of making them a cyborg, part machine. He said that 2020 was the year men agreed to be surveyed under their skin. What could he be talking about? And the survey under the skin was akin to snake venom. The survey under the skin, think on it. What was it? What's he speaking of? These spirits and these cunnings have now gotten involved for time is closing time is closing and yet the churches as a whole set back and sing your three songs and you always do a, the offering after your third second or third song and nothing changes nothing and yet a prophet speaks to you. I can't speak for the other prophets. I can only speak for the one I'm responsible for. This one. And yet, look at his looks. Look at his coat. Look at his hair. Listen to how crude he talks. Because I will speak of something that religion don't like talked about. I'll say, hell yes, hell no, speaking literally of a place that is trying to overtake the church with its ideas and its wiles of the devil. Paul went on to say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't criticize a prophet or a prophecy teacher until you can tell me what those four things he's talking about is. Do you even know? There are four classes of spirit. And I'm telling you of something that the WEF knows, the WHO knows, CERN knows, those who in instituted a pandemic knows, Noah Harari knows. It's only the ignorant churches who do not know or do not want to know. And I said and tell you the truth, and you don't listen to the truth. You try to interpret scripture through a carnal mind, through a mind that only fills itself with quigley down under, which is nothing wrong with, with watching certain things, but don't fill yourself up with things like that and expect to understand the supernatural until you spent time with the Lord. And you've looked at his word and its first place in your life. Until you will say, instead of going with, to, with my children on their birthday today, God has called me aside to study. And until you're ready to do such a thing and hear the word and even believe God is real. And don't lecture someone who, who is teaching something but yet ready to hear the Mormon church speak of a world that says Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. Or go and hear a Satanist talk about how Satan is your friend and how he's here to help you through the struggles. Blasphemy from a maggot-filled mouth who's covered in the shit of Satan. What is that? Don't even ask until you define the word. Oh, that's why we cut you off. You could be cutting off your nose to spite your face. You better listen. Don't criticize one prophet with one word that's ever said and you go watch worse than that as they use the F word over and over in front of your children late at night as you sit in front of a television and let your little children watch two people have sex almost in front of them on that screen and say every vile word and then when those words I just said comes out you say oh it's just that's, that's nothing. It's nothing until it comes into this setting. You're straining at gnats. You're straining out gnats, but you're swallowing camels. Now, if you've regained your composure, let's finish. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are spirits. These are spirit beings. They're spirit beings. I heard somebody say, we hate you. I heard that. Yes, you probably do. But it's not you that hates me. It's that spirit in you that hates me. Because I love you. I'm not sowing hate in you in order to reap hate. You're trying to sow hate into me and I won't have it. I will stand and love you even while you throw the stones of your words. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen and learn, these are spirits listed from the lowest rank to the highest rank. These are spirits listed 
Principalities are the lowest. Powers are the next. Rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. And each one carries a different aspect of the devil. Of Satan himself. It starts on the highest. We look at the highest. Well, I don't know that you're right, Brother Robin. And I appreciate you calling me brother. I appreciate that. You said it before you thought. I appreciate that. I mean that. But here is the thing. We start at the top. The WEF. We're not talking about some little business down on side on side of Maine somewhere. We're talking about the WEF, the World Economic Forum, just in case someone don't know. And we're talking about them who sit up there and Klaus Schwab, their spokesman, their mouthpiece for someone else, stands there and talks like a James Bond movie as he speaks of scientific things and the world reset and the great global reset. And he said, out of his mouth, he said, COVID and all these things were not crisis. He said, we are in transformation mode. Listen and wake up. We are in transformation mode, he said. And those who can manage the change will be all right. Those who don't manage the change, where does that leave them? Noah Harari, his advisor, the one they call the prophet, he said, if you don't get on board, they won't need you as a serf or a slave. Now the spiritual wickedness in high places are creating and have written some kind of document. It's almost as a written new constitution for a new world that's coming where there's only three classes of being, they, serfs, and slaves. Listen to what's being said. How, and your main politicians that you know, John Kerry, Jane Goodall, and the, oh, we love the earth. All that movement, all of them are part of it, of that. They've been on, the, on their boards and their panels, but then they bring this witch. You look it up, and she comes and blows upon their head. She blows upon their heads, and yet you get aggravated if an evangelist or someone blows on someone. But you just sit and look. Oh, look at that witch blowing on everybody's head. Isn't this funny? It's not to them. They lean forward into her breath. And then you see spiritual wickedness stray over and spread out to the WHO as the Gothard Tunnel recreated the ceremony of Pan to bring the god Pan from the underworld and bring him to the upper world so that he could per per perform a pandemonium and a pandemic, and they put it on the air. All around 2016, that happened. And they brought this. And it just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. And the false god Shiva and CERN on the temple of Apollo opened an underground portal where they made the statement, if we can open it, something may step through it or we could send something through it. These are scientists that the global communities support. What is this? It's an ancient plan. Well, I don't believe it. It does not change it whether you believe it or whether you don't. Now, I've got to say something, and I've got to do this quicker, I think. But then we move down the line to rulers of the darkness of this world. This means to make something look one way when it's in actuality another. In other words, it's an illusion world. These are the ones that put the plan in motion. 
to deceive the world, the wiles of the devil. The devil, the wiles of the devil. The devil, yes, the personal supreme spirit of evil, often represented in Christian belief as the tempter of humankind, the leader of all apostate angels, and the ruler of hell. The wiles. Hell has a plan and an agenda. And it's being seen by world leaders and acted upon. And now it's in an illusion world. And then it moves down to powers. Powers are the spirits that operate in the political leaders around the globe. WEF and all, that's way higher than political leaders. This operates in kings and governors and, and mayors and, and, and magistrates and whatever they may be. It operates in that realm to institute the illusion. And then the principalities are scattered among the populace to turn you to make you believe it. I hope you're listening to me today. Well, this sounds mighty heavy. Hell is for eternity. And I have to say something while there's still time. Then we begin to look at who would be more better to institute such a plan. So an organization was formed like a League of Nations. It's called the UN. And it stinks in the nostrils of God. It sends the odor of the shit up. Of the spittoons of the devil. And it smells in the, in the nostrils of God. And they begin to plan. They have 190-something nations gathered in their council. But notice what took place. Suddenly we see funds and, and power and ammunition and, and guns and cash being distributed among rogue nations of terrorism. And they come over the fence like ravenous dogs on October the 7th and attack the chosen people of God. They attack the place where God chose to put his name. A place where he revealed his whole revelation to us. Every prophet, all these people you read about, this is where they're from. Israel. Israel. The one God brought out of Jacob. And the children of Israel are the 12 tribes. And the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Yaakov. All of these come from there. And they wrote the scripture that you base your life on. And yet, we stand and listen while anti-Semitism rises on our campuses and begins to scream and bark and yell and spew venom at Israel to tear down our flag and fly the Palestinian flag, which is the four colors of the horsemen of the apocalypse. And just in case you missed their devious plan, look how the, the Olympic Games in Paris opened. And before that, if you'll remember, the Lord gave a prophetic word on this program or on, on, from this prophet that said, I am not pleased with you, Paris. I'm not pleased with you, France. Do you not remember that? And he told how he wasn't pleased with them and that they're doing this stuff again. And sure enough, they opened up those Olympic Games with a mockery of the Last Supper you denominational churches hang in the pictures on your rugs that you put up on the wall. And it shows Jesus like this with his heart showing and his hands out like this. 
This is what they mocked. They put a transgender in the place of the master. And they placed every abomination at his table. And you. Then they told you, oh, it doesn't mean this. It's actually portraying the gods, the myth, Greek mythology of the gods of Greece. There's always an explanation and Christians say, oh, 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 is that what it's doing? Dear God, let's get a painting of it and put it in my house. It, it's, it's so pitiful that the image of God is so deceived so easily. And then watch how they closed it. And if it wasn't enough, the horsemen of the apocalypse rode into it and opened it. Watch how they closed it. They closed the Olympics. They had a piano, music, wow, music. And they played a hymn to show you it was all a church service. It was a worship service. They played a hymn. It was called the hymn of Apollo. Apollo, where CERN has built their, their portal. Apollo, where the Kumean Sibyl gave the prophecy from Virgil's Anides that talked about Apollo returning and all of this. It's on the back of the $1 bill. And knew it coeptus, ordo seclorum, so forth. This is, it means Jupiter bless our new world order. Norvus ordo seclorum. It says, and knew it coeptus, norvo ordo seclorum. Jupiter bless our new world order. And the eye is the eye of Apollo. The eye. Now I'll close with this. In case that's not enough. I heard this prophetic word on 9-21-2024. Light and air. Light and air. September 22nd, 2024. Why is it that the UN pushes so hard against Israel? No matter what, it's no matter what, it's a blatant disrespect and a blatant conspiracy, a blatant stacked deck, a blatant pile on, a blatant fixed ref uh, 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 game. It's a blatant fixed referee game. No matter what Israel does, no matter what they do, they can do nothing right in the eyes of the UN. One has to ask themselves why. Why? God protect your people. Why? Play that video, please. Just five minutes of it. to the representative of Israel. Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, I sit here in this council as I did on Monday, Thursday, and now Friday, defending Israel's right to exist, to defend ourselves. Also on Tuesday and Wednesday, we sat at the General Assembly for two days watching the Israel bashing circus led by the Palestinian Authority as part of their diplomatic terrorism. Are there no other conflict in the world? Are there no other pressing matters that require this Council's attention? Or is the UN's obsession with condemning Israel so consuming that it blinds you to everything else? We did not seek this war. We did not. On October 8th, while Israeli civilians were still being slaughtered in the south by Hamas, Hezbollah 
I haven't told you, Mr. Minister, mentioning Hezbollah even once in your speech. Hezbollah unleashed hundreds of rockets at our civilians in the north. This was not provoked. It was a calculated assault to show support for Hamas, a declaration made by Hassan Asrallah himself. Since that day, over 8,000 rockets have rained down, 46 of our people have been murdered, 294 injured, and more than 60,000 remained displaced, unable to return to their homes in the north as Hezbollah attempts to burn them to the ground. Every day, Hezbollah's rockets deliberately target our civilians, attempting to destroy homes and force entire communities to flee in fear. Families have been torn apart. Twelve Israeli Druze children who were playing soccer one moment were dead the next. And still, the terror continues every day. Where was the international community? Human rights? Nowhere. Every day, rockets, missiles, drones. Hezbollah's relentless attacks have forced innocent civilians, parents, children, the elderly, to abandon everything. They are now refugees within their own country, living in temporary shelters, unsure of when or if they will ever return to the places they once called home. This is not just the displacement of individuals, but of entire lives, memories, and futures. It has been nearly a year, a year, since they were forced to flee, and still they wait for the day when it will be safe to return. Israel will not allow this to continue. Our objective is very clear. We will restore security to our northern border, and we will bring our people home. It is our responsibility. The goal of returning our displaced citizens has been formally included in the objectives of this war. We will do whatever it takes to achieve this, and we will not allow Hezbollah's terror to dictate the future of our nation. If Hezbollah does not retreat from our border and back to the north of the Litani River through diplomatic efforts, Israel will be left with no choice but to use any means within our rights to defend our citizens and enable the evacuees of the north to return to their homes. Hezbollah has turned southern Lebanon into a war zone, using civilian homes as weapons depots and unifil bases as launch points, digging tunnels beneath them and using innocent civilians as well as UN peacekeepers as the human shields. This is not just an attack on Israel. It is a crime against Lebanon itself. Hezbollah has brought untold suffering, not just to Israelis, but to the Lebanese people, who are also trapped in the grip of this terrorist organization. If this modus operandi sounds familiar, it is because the same is used by another terror organization, Hamas also using civilians. Yet, the Lebanese foreign minister who sits here today could not find the courage to even mention Hezbollah. We know that is a problem. Yes, why would you show that, Brother Robin? I appreciate you calling me, Brother. Why would you show that? Well, I want you to listen to something, and, and, and we're just, now just let your mind think on this a minute. We are looking at a real, now see, I deal in the world of the spirit, not the world of the natural. Uh, the war I talk about we're in is in the spirit. It's fought with the name of Jesus, the word of God. Uh, the scripture and your knowledge of the scripture. That's how you fight in a spiritual war. 
So I'm not speaking of the scripture said here. You know, Paul said this. He said, uh, uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. He said, finally, in verse 10, Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, that's not your fight. Now, we've got to get that through our heads. You can't take a gun and shoot a spirit. It takes a more powerful weapon than that. It takes something in the spirit to deal with the spirit world. And the only thing that can do that is the word of the living God spoken of in love and faith. And it's got to be spoken of out of a pure heart. And you have to speak the word as if you have authority to use the word. I remember one time this woman came across, and I'm going to get to this video. I remember one time this woman came across the street. And just jumped all over Robin. I mean, she was cussing and raving and just headed over there at her physically. And Robin just looked at her and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. She stopped in her tracks cold. Because Robin spoke to that spirit. And that spirit driving her left her holding the bag. And she just stopped. Went back to her house. When the police, the chief of police, went to her house, she said, she used the name of Jesus like a weapon on me. Well, she didn't use it. Well, yeah, but it wasn't directly at you. It was that spirit. You can hear that spirit when it seethes and writhes. You can just hear it when it does it. But when that name is mentioned. Now, why would I show that video? Because what they did to Israel was unprovoked and it was an atrocity. If you can't even stand to see some of the pictures, you couldn't even show the pictures on here, they would deem it hate crimes. They'd deem it hate speech, or uh, I mean speech, not crime. Hate speech, if I show, if you were to show the images of those raped women and how they butchered them, and how they beheaded children and little infants and killed parents in front of their children and children in front of their parents, wiped out whole kibbutz. Well, just went in and like ravenous dogs or wolves and just devoured them. And yet Israel's the one criticized. And the nations all saying, we demand you pull out of Gaza. We demand you pull out of here. You don't do this and don't do that. And their own resolution... 1701 and 1559 told Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah to go back beyond the 18-mile uh, perimeter back beyond the Latani River. Their own resolution. They never did, and they've been building weaponry and strongholds there till there's 100,000 Israelis driven from their homes while they take anti-tank weapons and blow houses up. But they don't have anywhere to come back to. And their operation was Operation Take Over Galilee or something. Well, you ain't getting it. Now, why would I mention that? Because it's the United Nations that are speaking against it. Whoa. And when they all voted that Israel has to immediately cease fire. Well, if you want to cease fire, won't you tell them to shut up, put their, tell Hezbollah and Hamas, shut up, put their weapons down, turn those hostages loose, and there wouldn't be no more firing. Nobody tells them that. Nobody. So they tell Israel, you have to do it. Whoa. Really? Wonder why. It's amazing how stuff is woven into things that we don't even see that shows you it's not flesh and blood doing it because I doubt seriously any flesh and blood would even, could even put that together in their minds. There's spirits involved with personalities. And Satan and hell, the devil, has wiles and an agenda, and he's shaping this thing up mostly unknowing to, a, to most people. Now, it's known by some, yes. Who? I don't know. They know who they are. But here is the thing. It was revolution, uh, 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 Resolution <laughs> 1701 
1559. You hear that? You'll hear that said. Take note of that every time you hear that said. All they're doing is enforcing this, but the UN don't mention this. 1701, 1 plus 7 plus 0 plus 1 is 9. 1559, 1 plus 5 plus 5 plus 9 is 20. 9, if you, if you add this way and you boil the 20 down to a 2, it's 11. 9, 10, 11. That's summing everything to the single digit. So 1701 and 1559 added up is 3260. Think about that. Equals 20 uh, from the Hebrew year 5785. Uh, what is that? 2025 it equals. Well, 5785, if you minus 3260, is 2025. You minus 3760, which is the year of creation from 5785, the Hebrew year. It's 2025. It's always the year we're living in. Why am I telling you all that? Because if you take the UN resolutions and you add them and you subtract 2025, uh, 2525 from 2025, does anybody have any idea what that number is? It's 500. 2025 from 2025, 2525 from 2025, is, there's 500 years difference. Right? It's amazing to me how the number 500 in the New Testament, in the New Testament, in the Strong's Concordance, in the Greek, every time it's Antichristos. Every time it's Antichrist, 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 Antichrist. It's a very blatant looming thing that shows you what these spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of the darkness of this world, uh, uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, powers and principalities, all are pushing toward bringing the Antichrist into being. Now you know why Israel's not heard. No matter what, somebody asked the other day, could Israel do anything right? If they did anything, would anybody, would they still, would they say it was right? And, and the guy said, no. There's nothing Israel can do that's right. Well, just look up the UN and you look at the colored beast, the different colored beast that's out in their yard. Just look that up. Look those images up. You'll start figuring out things real quick. And all of them are against Israel. And what got me is when they ordered the ceasefire, America didn't stand up and say, we, we, we're on the side of Israel. They just abstained from the vote. Abstention don't, don't, it, it don't absolve you from responsibility. Anyway, this prophet came today to tell you a truth of an ancient time, an ancient war that goes beyond, far beyond flesh and blood. And if you think I'm kidding you, why all at once you see all these Haitian immigrants everywhere by the thousands? And someone told me yesterday, said, right over here in one of our neighboring towns, they have a video, the police does, where one has a goose by the neck going to eat it. And they have these where... Pets are involved. It's not all Haitian people. But within Haiti is where voodoo originated. That's where it comes from. It was brought to New Orleans by uh, someone named Marie Laveau. Remember uh, uh, Dr. John would carry his voodoo staff out on stage. And, well, embedded, surrounded by these Haitian people. 
are these voodoo witch doctors. Because the witches in this nation, oh, I don't even believe all that. That's the problem. And I'm not talking to the average person. I'm talking to pastors and believers. You do understand, right, that they're really doing it. The night of the debate, witches had gathered and was chanting and doing rituals to, in support of Kamala. What does that tell you? But witches wasn't strong enough to get it done. So suddenly, voodoo high priests are showing up everywhere. One right here in the town next to us. Someone came and asked for a chicken so they could offer it. This was the report that came. So they could offer it for their daughter's birthday as a sacrifice. Why would this all of a sudden show up in this city, this city, this city, this state, this state, this place, this place? Satan knows what he's doing. He's pushing in witchcraft, voodoo, all this kind of stuff. Now you see in Birmingham coming, I don't know what date it's coming, the Long Island witch is coming down there to Birmingham. Why Birmingham? Oh, I don't know. That's because Vulcan is, is, uh, stands up there. Vulcan is an illegitimate son of Satan who was cast into hell, or one of his sons that was cast into hell are supposed to be, they call him Zeus's son, which is Satan's son. They, they put him in hell forging weapons for them to fight with because he was so ugly they wouldn't let him up around all the other gods. And he stands with his 40-ton buns mooning Homewood. I don't know. There's a goat man down there about a mile from where this witch is going to be and so forth. He's standing there with a witch's tea uh, standing up like this with an owl on the top of it. He's a head of a goat and a body of a man. And he's holding out the book of life like this while all the little animals around him are shaped like a pentagram. Maybe that's why she's coming there. Maybe she don't like prophets. Maybe they're doing all they can, but why come to Birmingham? And, and this was the report. Well, she's going to teach you how to communicate with your dead relatives. The Bible forbids necromancing. Pretty stiff penalties for necromancing in the Old Testament. Die, die. That was the penalty then. Think about it. Now, that's how God looked at it. So, Christians, now don't talk much about anything or anybody if you're going to go down there and let some witch tell you how to talk to your dead relatives. And if you find yourself in there, don't say, oh, this is nothing. It's just a sideshow. Not to her. Well, I probably said enough to make four countries mad and half a hell, so that's probably enough for today. Today, I'm going to receive the offering right here. Krista said, praise God. <laughs> you know, I haven't come on with that heavy a program in a long time, but I hadn't been led to in a long time. But I'm just trying to tell you as a Christian where we stand, or where we should stand. This is why things should bug you if it don't bug anybody else. is because you know who you're fighting. You know what's going on. And you need to remember that when it comes time to stand up for this nation. Stand up for the nation. Going out there and warping somebody in the head with something ain't going to help nothing. Learn to fight from where real power is, in the spirit. You can do that in the privacy of your prayer closet. But you pastors, you should be teaching the people this. You are responsible for talking about things like that. And if you don't, you're not doing your job. I'm doing my job, really. Do you ever preach about hell? Yes. Do you ever preach about heaven? Yes. Well, good. All right. Well, 
I want to go ahead and give you opportunity to give today. I wasn't sure how I was going to receive the offering today or whether I even should. But today, if you'd like to give, and I know all of our partners out there, the partners of the 11th hour out there going, because you understand spiritual warfare. Spend some time in praise and worship. Spend some time worshiping the Lord. Spend some time in the Scripture. Spend some time in the Word. Put the Word in your heart. Nothing scares hell like the Word. Spend some time. Hallelujah. And if a lot of you critics that hate us so, you want to clip something, why don't you clip all this and show all of this to somebody? You ain't got the blame nerve because a lot of you may be involved in all that. But those Christians that are not, take heed. If nothing else, when you go to lunch today and you eat a hamburger, sit down and at least let this go over in your mind and go, hmm, there is something more going on than we realize. You really don't think hell is just going to sit down and let you just do what you want. Genesis 3.15, let's put that on the screen, and that'll be the scripture before we receive our offering today. Genesis 3.15, now you understand what the Lord was talking about when he came up on the scene to Adam, his wife, and the serpent. He came up on them, and, the, and, and listen to this. He comes up in here, well, we'll, we'll read down to 15. Start in verse 9. Well, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is after they had sinned. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Isn't it something that the first thing you do when you sin is you try to hide yourself from the presence of the Lord. As if he's going to hurt you. And he's really your only help. He wants you to run to him, not from him. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Beguiled her. Deceived her. The scripture said in the New Testament, The woman was deceived. The man was not deceived. That's why the seed of the woman, Jesus, could come through her womb. It was clean. She was deceived in her soul. And her husband attributed to that. And the Lord God said to the serpent, now listen close, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So you're going to have to eat dust now. That's why the, the Satan, the, a serpent can't see well, can't hear well. All he can do is taste. That's why that tongue runs out all the time. He's tasting the air for dust. Anywhere dust is being kicked up, he knows there's his next meal, a potential meal. So he heads over there that direction. And so that's why when you get in the flesh and you start cursing and, and doing and judging and doing things, that serpent smells and tastes dust. He starts licking that tongue out everywhere. He'll come right to it. And religion kicks up more dust than anything in the world. I'd a whole lot rather listen to a good old drunk stand there and talk to me and tell me the truth than to listen to a religious spirit lie to me of why God won't do something. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He said, I'm going to put war between you and the woman, 
between your seed and her seed. So it's the seed of the serpent. That's the Antichrist he's talking about. It's the Antichrist he's talking about. The seed of the serpent. And her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, it's like what was brought out on prophetic connections. It's going to be a head game. It's going to be a head war. It's going to be over beguilement. It's going to be over deception. It's going to be over plush devils. It's going to be over letting this into your life, your church, your home, your schools, anything. It doesn't matter colleges. It doesn't matter where it's at. As long as the ideas of liberalism and as long as the ideas of communism and as long as the ideas can be placed within the confines of sound doctrine, then it's a beguilement. The sound doctrine, the reason the enemy mingles it with sound doctrine is because it's like Adam standing there listening to the conversation while the woman was being deceived and he was the sound doctrine that could have spoke up and stopped it. But it got mingled in it. and She saw nothing wrong and was beguiled and deceived and ate of the fruit. But the scripture said she turned to her husband there with her and he did eat. You have to remember something. Subversion is the tactic of Satan. Subversion means to come in first and demoralize something. This is what Sun Tzu taught in the ancient 3,000, over 3,000 years ago in the art of war that most militaries are mandatory. They study it. It's how to overthrow a nation and a people without firing a shot. A bloodless coup. How to make it happen is through subversion. He said, first of all, you come in and you demoralize a generation. You begin to demoralize it. And you put out your principles first of what you think. This is what the Soviet Union did. They used to put it out of what you think. And they would put it out there as an alternative, even though it was repulsive to you when you first seen it. Once it's demoralized enough, you begin to look at it more favorable. And so they do this through schools and colleges and things like that. They said you have to graduate. It has to be done over a period of like three college graduation generations. And once that happens, then you've got a demoralized generation. They couldn't see the truth, they said, if you handed it to them in black and white. They could read it and not see through it. And there's, those are the people then are sent into politics, into media, into all of that. And they've demoralized the, the, the whole nation with their radicalization of teaching. And they look over, and the Soviets used to put it out this way, better read than dead. They thought it was going to collapse. And he said this takes 15 to 20 years to demoralize a generation, a country said, then as soon as it's demoralized and you have these people in place, you send in and destabilize the nation. said, you begin immediately to cause riots, uprisings. They protest. They begin to show all kinds of riots like in Portland and like in all of that in the, and on their college campuses with the Palestinian flags. It doesn't matter to them. They don't care. They don't make any difference. I mean, they get it all squirreled up until you have queers for Palestine. Do you know how that's an oxymoron? You know how that, what that is? That's like saying chickens for KFC. The Palestinians will throw you queers off of buildings. You called yourself that. They'll throw homosexuals off of buildings. They will kill them. But they don't care right now. Just the devil just wants it destabilized. Then they bring in crisis. Crisis. And they say once a nation hits crisis mode, there's no coming back. It will take a foreign invasion or a total civil war to bring it back. Think about that. That's what happened in Grenada. And America was the foreign invasion that went in and, and delivered it. So crisis, one crisis after another is trying to be brought up. 
uh, uh, sicknesses, uh, all these things, anything to bring up a crisis to where we're looking at a new ideology. There seems to be no pulling back. And the Lord, I'll never forget this. He told me one time, he said, since there's not going to be a civil war, he said that, I'll never forget it. He said, since there's not going to be a civil war, he said, I will invade from heaven and deliver the nation. And that's, this is part of that invasion, me teaching today. We're teaching the word of God. This is the invasion from heaven. Speak the word, teach the word. Hallelujah. Well, if you want to give today, the ways to give are on your screen. I want you to remember this, never forget this. In Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Notice that word, it, it. What is the it? It's whatever you gave. Whatever you gave. He said, give, and it, whatever you gave, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give it into your bosom? For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured back to you again. So if you're giving friendship, you'll be given friendship. If you're giving uh, love, you'll receive love. If you're giving hate, you'll receive hate. But it also transcends and steps right over and over into monetary things. If it don't include the fleshly things, then how come when you gave it your seed, you got it a child? It moves into the physical realm now. So if you give money, if you need money and you give money, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall it, the money, be given back to you again? That's just pretty simple. Now, it's like Jesse said one time. Now, don't complicate that. Don't complicate that. That's that, really that simple. And so how much do you give? Whatever the Lord impresses you to give. Whatever he tells you. If it's a quarter, then give that quarter with all the faith in the world, man. Faith in the world. Faith in heaven that you can bring up. You give it. You give it in faith. If it's 50 cents, do it 50 cents. If it's $5, $5, $500, $500, 5000 5 million. And give it with the same faith. And it shall be given to you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Wow. That means you put it in, shake it down, put it in, shake it down, put it in, press it down, put it in until it finally just starts running over. So that's how men will give it back to you. Hallelujah. And if you're a tither, the scripture says, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke that. I, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, he said. And he'll not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, if you believe that, then tithe. Tithe. If you have a church you'd go to, and they feed you tithe. If this is where you come to get fed, tithe. But tithe in faith. Hallelujah. Give in faith. Praise God. Now, Father, I thank you for blessing their giving today. I thank you for blessing what they're giving and how they're sowing. Lord God, I pray that we have testimonies now of things coming in, Lord, where people have been blessed from this program today. In Jesus' name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, there's not one person in this world I hate. I hate the devil. But he's not a person. He's a spirit. And he's a rogue spirit. And all dead and dying humanity, the blood of them drips off of his hands. Hallelujah. Praise God. From the very first murder. He was a murderer from the beginning. In the world before Adam, he killed trying to mingle seed. He killed Abel. He's a murderer. 
Hallelujah. Well, I thought I'd get into that today, maybe another day. Well, I want to invite you to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm sure a lot of Satanists were watching today. A lot of witches, a lot of, of voodoo people were watching today because I know you watch me. I know you do. And uh, you know you do, and I know you do. And some of you are sitting there denying it to yourself. I, I don't watch him looking right at me right now. I mean, how, how bad is that when you deceive your own self? But you're watching, and you know what you heard is true. You're just a little bit afraid to do something about it. Well, here's what you pray. Number one, you just go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I believe in my heart. Now, this is what the Apostle Paul said, pray. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, you will be saved. So from the lowest witch watching, from the little Wiccan all the way up, to the big hicken, I don't know, whatever you are, whatever, all the way up, makes no difference. This prayer is more powerful than anything you've ever encountered. You say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. Come into my heart and be my Lord and personal Savior. Cleanse me of all sin. Wipe me clean, Lord, of all sin and sin consciousness. Hallelujah. And say this, I renounce Satanism. I renounce witchcraft. I renounce these things. And I throw them far from me. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Some of you don't know what that is, but it's about to be a big surprise to you. I, just say this out loud. You know, there's, a, there's a, an experience subsequent to salvation called being baptized in the mighty Holy Ghost. So you just say this. Jesus said, I baptize. Uh, John said, I baptize you in water. He said, but there's one coming after me talking about Jesus that will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. So the Holy Ghost baptized you in Jesus and you got saved. Now he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. The mighty spirit of God that fluttered over the face of the deep and boom, created. And began to release the word of God. That's, he's waiting He's in you now, a witness of him. Now he wants to come up on you. You just say this, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. And then just start praising him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then just whatever sounds and words you hear begin to release out of your mouth. Behold, all you Satanist and voodoo priestess. Behold, says the Lord, I have spoken. And you heard a word here and there. But you didn't hear your language. You heard mine in the spirit. And behold, says the Lord, I will deliver you today on the spot. And I will make you as powerful in the prophetic as you are in the world of the damned. Come to me like a child and give me your heart. And I will see to you and your family, and I will protect you from the evils that you so fear. For hell will have to draw back, and I will put a bloodline between you and them, and it'll be the blood of my son, the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it's been good to be with you today on the 11th hour. Uh, until we're here next week, um, I want you to remember something. Never forget, 